Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where today we are going to be having a conversation with Jessica Fields. With (laughs) Jessica Fields, the poet whose book, When a Grasshopper Whispers, is what we're going to be talking about today. A poetic memoir. We talk about kind of a lot of stuff. We talk about um, the social media marketing for her book. We talk about the subject matter of the book, which is mental health and um, the struggles that come from that what things she did and how those things worked for her. And then we also talked a little bit about postpartum book release, how you you go so hard when you're launching a book and then the book comes out and like what that does to you and how that feels and how to get through that. We also talk about how many fans, like true fans, do you need to survive? Um, We talk about the sophomore slump, book sales philosophy, parenting as an artist and how to pass down that creativity to your kids Um, we talk about some different uh, people like rick rubin and julia cameron we talk about promoting confidence um, what jessica felt the hardest part of selling a book is um, becoming an authority on a subject we talk about trim size and formatting nightmares and um, the importance or lack thereof of an mfa so we go through all sorts of stuff and it was just a wonderful conversation she dropped some freaking knowledge bombs like just like pearls of wisdom here and there throughout the thing that cracks me up because as she's coming to you she's very unassuming and she's just talking and everything's fine and then all of a sudden it's like socrates punch you in the face like Take this and deal with it, fucker. So it's it's really fucking cool how that happens on here. Now, I forgot again to have her read a poem of hers during the interview, but um, she was kind enough to send me a poem. I wrote her back. I'm like, oh my God, I forgot to ask you to do this. So she, uh, th- there will be, after the episodes, uh, maybe I'll put it in the middle. I don't know. Maybe I'll put it in the middle. I haven't decided yet. We'll figure that out. So there is that. And here I am, caught with my dick in my hand again. Wait, what? What What was that? Hang on, guys. The grasshopper is whispering. What, what, what's it saying? Oh, five stars on iTunes. Come on, guys. Listen to the fucking grasshopper. Get, get, get with it. Get with it, guys. Come on. Jessica, sorry for using your book as a prop. <laughs> I was thinking about that as I was, I'm like, oh, th- this might be a bit rude. So, sorry, hope that was okay. So yeah, um, go rate and review all this stuff. So there's a few things that I want to clarify, and I might do it at the end of the episode, because I don't want to kind of, I don't want to give away some of the things that we talk about. But the thing I want to specify right off the bat, when we are talking about how, like, her sales were, And she was talking about getting her check from Amazon. She was selling her book for, I think, $9.99 when it first came out. And I'm not 100%, but I'm going to guess that her profit on that was probably around three to four bucks. That's going to be my guess, around three to four bucks. Maybe, yeah, something around there. The second thing is... Amazon pays you late. Whatever books you sell, you get the money for those books 60 to 90 days later. Okay? And her book launched the week of Thanksgiving. So that first check she got was basically a week's a week and a couple days worth of sales. Um, I can't remember if she was doing a pre-order for her book or not i think she did but especially on a first book pre-orders don't really do a whole lot you know so i just wanted to throw that out there in case like you're like confused at what we're talking about at that point and then there are a couple things that we'll get to at the end that when i come back for the butt plugs i'll kind of clear up with that said let's get into the shout outs while you're picking up jessica's book 
pick up mine too. Poem's about fucking. Might as well, you know? So I want to give a shout out to those good motherfuckers over on Patreon. I want to give a thank you to Chase, to Michael, to Deborah, to Cedar, to Harry. Thank you guys so much. I want to give a thank you to the thank you crew on YouTube, Patrick and Britt and JH and Jan and Alan. Thank you guys. I appreciate you. Um, and then for the big swinging lawnmowers over at the Anarchy Crew, I want to give a big thank you to you. To Bunny, to Nate, to Mindy, to Hannah, to Thomas, to Tim J, to Lisa, to Josh, to Shaylin, to Caitlin, to Jessica, to Tim G, and to Chill Baby. Thank you guys so much. And I also want to give a thank you to some of the people who were there and they can't be there anymore. You were still supporting me and I appreciate you. So um, thank you to Andrew and to AM and to Kent. Um, to Aaron, people who have to take a dip away, I understand completely. No big deal there. And then the biggest of the swinging lawnmowers from Lawnmower Town over in the home improvement area, that would be the number one chappy over the Chat Book of the Month Club, the SDG. Thank you so much. You are fucking awesome. You guys all are great, and I appreciate you. You guys are fantastic. And now, on with the show. Okay, so lovely to see you. Very you excited. Too. Let's talk about your book, and it's on my other desk. Do you have a copy of your book? There it is. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's talk about how it went. How did it go? I, I tell you what, the the beginning of like the writing process was like, I didn't even know I was writing a book. So that part was like two years in the working. But then when I decided I wanted to put it together, that was like eight weeks. And so we were just grinding, like editing, going back and forth and designing covers. And, and so that went by super fast and, you know, promoting the book and everything. So now that I look back on it, I'm like, I blinked and here it is. <laughs> That's kind of crazy. Seriously. Like you did such a good job with all of like the like reels and TikToks and shorts and all that stuff you were doing. Like you fit doing stuff like that. Like there's a lot of people who I feel like if they were to do those things would kind of fall on their face or feel like they don't know like how to even get into that. And it was so freaking natural for you. Like it just, everything you, everything you did seemed like you did it with ease. And it was just like, you know, this is it. This is how it goes. Now, do you feel like you grew your audience at all by doing those things and um, selling books? Like, did you, do you know if you sold any books from people coming through those channels? Yeah, actually I did. I got my first check from Amazon two weeks ago. And whopping 98 bucks. I was so excited <laughs> because the word has been spreading just through people reading it. And then yeah. so I'm getting a lot more sales through recommendations. Um, you know, people just saying they could be in conversation, like I'm dealing with mental health stuff. And they're like, oh, well, my wife just wrote a book or my daughter just wrote a book. And then people are like buying it on the spot. It's crazy. <laughs> That's so rad. And I just want you to know that you making... $98 on your book is more than most poets make in a lifetime. Oh, yes. So celebrate yourself on that. That's huge. That is so, so good. Oh my God. That's so awesome. I'm so that's, that's, that's great. Okay. So we did like a little like brainstorming sesh before the book came out. Now, some of that stuff, when we were talking, you were saying like, this is this feels kind of heavy. I don't know. This is going to be kind of hard on all that jazz. How did it go? And like, what steps did you go through? Was there anything that you were like, I can't do this. I'll do this instead. Like what, how did that whole process go? Um. Well, when you gave me like the outline of like week by week, that helped out like tremendously with marketing and like getting everything together. So I wasn't so overwhelmed like day to day. Um. So I kind of planned to, backlog my stuff. So I took a week and I just recorded reels or I took a week and I just 
did my promotions and then I kind of scheduled it to flow out. So I wasn't working too much every single day because I was still editing in the process of marketing, which made it hectic. Yeah. Um, if you, in hindsight, I probably would have wanted to have the book done and then went into the marketing part of it, but I did it all at once. So that was kind of a lot. So, um, yeah, that's the only thing I would have done differently. And for the most part, I just kind of stuck to the script. And, and it, like I said, it was just so much going on at one time that it just all kind of came out organic. Yeah, that's awesome. We talked to a little bit about you feeling like after the book came out, and I don't mean to draw attention to this through your book as well, but like it just glowed out when this happened, but like there was kind of like a postpartum slump after mm -hmm. the book came out. Can you explain like what happened and what you were feeling like? Yeah. So I think that's not talked about enough in the writing community where we're, we're doing so much work and then we don't oftentimes give ourselves enough time to rest. And then we feel like it's a never ending cycle of like pushing and marketing and self-promoting and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it doesn't stop and we work independently and we work for ourselves so it's like we're the only ones advocating for ourselves most of the time and as we had done the book in such a short time I was burnt out <laughs> I had to like I had to really focus and be like what do I want to do with this book because to keep going and to keep making the reels and to keep I didn't want to just be a salesman like I didn't want to just sell my book I wanted it to impact my readers. And so in order to do that, I had to go inside myself and be like, how do I want to share this with the world? How do I want to present it to the world? And I just didn't feel like, you know, like buy my book. Hey, look at my book. Like I just felt it didn't feel natural for me. And, and I didn't, it didn't sit right with me. So I had to take some time off to kind of recollect and be like, what is the purpose behind the book? Not just sales. Like what is, what is this book supposed to do for people? And that's kind of where I was at with it. Just so you know, too, for those of you who are just listening to this and not watching this, you guys missed out because you would have got a amazing like lesson on how to do a thumbnail for a video. <laughs> Jessica <laughs> just did this whole thing, like buy my book and then did a pose with the book. <laughs> You're so good at your freaking ridiculous thumbnail game dude it's just like it's like so easy for you like you're sitting here going yes i don't want to just keep selling my book but look how good i am at it it's like oh <laughs> shit oh that's fucking hysterical oh man okay so when you originally wanted to kind of take time off it sounded almost like defeat you mm -hmm. know and then all of a sudden, like you've changed your channel name and you're doing all this stuff and like you're right back going. So what happened? Yeah. I felt like when well, my channel was called The Soft Spoken Poet and that was, it worked for a while, but I felt like, what am I offering to my viewers, to my readers? And I don't want to just offer my persona, um, my ego. And sometimes when you have a channel like that, it's, I was just posting a lot of my work and it was more like a portfolio of me, 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 look what I'm doing. And I felt like I had to brainstorm and be like, how can I be of service to the YouTube platform and to writing material that helps other people? And so um, I do a lot of content on vlogging and and I, I read a lot. I read a lot of self-help books. I just finished The Creative Act and I finished that in like three days. Um, so I, good. Julia Cameron's work. I have nine of her books that I'm working through. Um, I just started Course in Miracles, which is a whole like thick book um and that's been helping me kind of stay grounded and focus on my purpose and and that's just to be of service and so because I do a lot of informative like just how to be is how to be an artist we're all artists and mm -hmm. whether it comes out in writing or painting or music or whatever totally. we're all created to be creative and so I was like how can I bring that to other people's where they can be creative too. So the whole, like, are you still in your sabbatical from writing right now? Yes and no. I have, well, I have two kids books that I, I did last year and I'm in the process of like figuring out how to illustrate them. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. Cause I wanted to get those books out by the end of the year, but I've been trying to take workshops and go to those free, like you know, poetry things so I can, you know, collect some work and stay in my practice. Um, and I also journal every day. My journal's back there, but I do like three morning pages every day. 
Um, sometimes it's just ranting and sometimes my writing comes out. And so, yeah, I've been doing that. And then I do automatic writing. Um, I've been recording some of those sessions for YouTube, which will be up, I think next month, I have a video coming up, automatic writing in real time. And it's kind of cool how that works. So mm -hmm. with the whole like marketing side of your launch for your book, what do you think was the hardest thing for you to do? Ask people to buy it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So did you come I, I, up with any creative ways to do that without actually doing that? I'm usually passive about it. I'm like, hey, I got this thing out. You totally don't have to. But if you're interested, I do the whole that whole bit to kind of give them an out. But I think promoting more confidence would have helped me like, hey, I just wrote this book. You should get it because it's so good. Like next my next book, I plan to do more of that energy because being so passive about it and it's kind of this. I don't believe in my own book. and. You shouldn't either. So I, I wanted to work on that. But yeah. Uh, well, well, the thing that makes that difficult for you, I think, especially is because you wrote a book of poetry that is focused on mental health. In order for you to be able to sell that to people, you need to present yourself as an authority on that subject from mm -hmm. like living through it and doing what you had to do. But if you don't do that, then it's like, why is anyone going to listen to anything you have to say on the subject? Whereas yeah. if you were just going, oh, I, I just, I'm a poet and I wrote some poetry, here you go. That would be mm -hmm. one thing. But because you were like, hey, I'm doing this because I believe what I have gone through is valuable and I believe I could help you, you right. know? And like, so that's like one of those things that like you have to figure out a creative way that feels good to you to show people that you are an authority on the subject yeah I actually I had started a project called soft-spoken radio like two years ago and then I quit doing it but it's like a podcast where I talk about mental health and I just every week I have a topic spirituality or jealousy or creativity whatever the topic is of the week and at the end of my videos I've been putting my book at the last slide like where they can get it and stuff like that so I don't talk anything about the book, but the subjects I talk about are in the book. And so it kind of be like, oh, she knows what she's talking about, like how she got through certain things and how to handle certain things in life. And it's helpful for me too, just to have a diary of like, so I can go back to it and listen to myself. Yeah. Like, yeah I saw that you were talking about, you're like, Hey, I'm going to be doing this again. And mm -hmm. I'm like, again, what's, what's yeah. happening? What is this? So that's I got scared. Last, the last time I tried to do it, I'm like, I'm not an authority figure on this and I don't know if it's helpful. And so I've been trying to put those thoughts behind me and be like, you know what, screw it, like do what you want to do and make what you want to make. And if people like it, great. But you, but, but you are an authority on this, yes. you know, like you have gone through the things you have put the work in and you have done the work and put the work out. You are an authority on this. Don't sell yourself short on that. <laughs> Like you got this, you know, I was going to start a line, a clothing line, and I was going to put it on my website, but I'm still working on that. Um, this is one of my shirts. That's awesome. Ride or die. Um, yeah. So I'm working on that. So I hope by establishing that it kind of drives traffic that way. But right now it's kind of quiet over there. That's actually so cute. Yeah. Ride or die. That's good. Nice. That's, that's really clever. <laughs> Look at you. Clever, clever. <laughs> Um, well, no, Dimit that, that was Dimitri's idea because it had it had the word di like die, uh -huh. and I was like, I got a promo of it, and I was like, I feel so weird walking around with die on my shirt. I don't want people to think I'm like, you should die, you should die. <laughs> I was like, just use the, you know, the info <sighs> thing, the graphic, and I was like, that's brilliant. And so that's, that's so funny. I was going to ask you too about your trim size for your book. Uh -huh. like, why did you pick that size? I wish I had the other one. I wish I had the proof because when I. When I did it originally, it was like this much bigger. Okay. And it didn't feel right in my hand. I was like, it feels so floppy when I, and I, so I just went through my bookshelf and I started picking up books and like holding it and pretending like I was reading an open mic or something. And, and I was like, okay, which one would I be comfortable holding? Because you had t told me like, make sure your poems are not on multiple pages. Cause you're gonna have to flip through it. And I'm like, I didn't think about that. So I made sure I held the book, like sample books to make sure. I would be comfortable holding my own yeah. book. So that's how that came about. I think it's a 5.5 by 7.5 or something like that. It's, yeah, I was going to, I thought it was even like a 5 by 7. Maybe, yeah, something like that. So 5 by 8 
ish something. <laughs> yeah, like it, it's uh, it's an interesting size. And you did that through Amazon? Yeah, it's one of the presets on Amazon. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. Because like I thought they just did like six by nine and some other yeah. ridiculous There's size. like four that they show you. And then there's like a dot, dot, dot. And if you click that drop down, like a whole bunch of other sizes comes up. Yeah. Like with kids books, you know, they tend to be larger and, and you can custom size and stuff like that. So now when you pick that size, I'm going to ask you a question here. Was your PDF final in the same trim size as the book you picked? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> and it wasn't. How, how, how did that go? I thought I was proficient using Word documents, but this book really challenged me in learning extra things. So that's something I learned is like never stop learning about stuff. And so I had to learn how to do margins and yeah. And then I threw in the pictures and the quotes and all that stuff. And so and then I had to learn how to do a table of contents, which I'd never done before, like mm-hmm. the, the proper way, not like you have to highlight and it like automates it for you yeah putting it in by hand and it wasn't lining up and i was getting so mad (laughs) totally that's so funny like i remember the first well the first book i ever self-published um it wasn't even through amazon it was before like the amazon kdp thing happened and it was with lulu and the (laughs) when i got the proof copy of the book the all the text was sideways and none of the pages corresponded to one another and i'm like what the fucking hell is this like nothing made sense i was like Mm -hmm. looking at it like a a centerfold in a playboy or something like nothing (laughs) nothing worked on it and i was so confused and that took me forever to figure out but um i remember i think the thing that screwed me up so bad when i did fingering the mundane was that i knew the book was going to be six by nine and when i made my original first pdf like the preset i had already made in scrivener to make a six by nine document i Mm -hmm. didn't click and so it did like an eight and a half by 11 and i'm like oh yeah so we're still at about 120 pages this is fine no big deal Mm -hmm. when i was looking at my digital proof copy I was like, what the hell is this? Like, none of this looks right. So then I, and this is how I screwed up all my numbers and everything. The uh, the first run print or the first thing I put together at six by nine was like 300 and, 340 pages. Yeah. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm not even going to be able to afford to print this book. Like, right. this, yeah. is, this is way bigger than I thought it was going to be. And I had <laughs> to like do a bunch of creative stuff to get it down to where um, the crowdfunding campaign, like the money I made from it actually paid for me to get books made. It was like, mm-hmm. I I completely thought I was going to lose my mind there. But like your, the size of your book is so comfortable. It's so comfortable. Yeah. I, I've been trying to figure out and then like with the whole like publishing company thing, I'm like, okay, these books are going to be this size. These books are going to be this size. And um, I was really on the fence about your size book. And I'm like, is this the best size book? Yeah. It might be the best size book I've ever held. And I'm like going back and forth. I'm just like, it it blew my mind. When when I got it from you, I was like, this is a perfect book. And it fits in envelopes. This book is amazing. Like, I... (laughs) This is so stupid that this was like the nerd part of me that like completely lost my mind. But the size of your book, seriously, from I don't know if it's like an OCD or an autistic thing or what, but the size of your book made me so freaking happy <laughs> for days. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, good job. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad I could bring joy. But yeah, now I'm going to be like really like angry about it with all my future books. Like they're all going to up because if I put it on my bookshelf I'm gonna be like ah they don't fit together (laughs) yeah well I was kind of like that too where I was like every size of the book has to be exactly the same but Mm -hmm. then I realized that like I have tons of books that are all different sizes already I need to not be so precious about that like if (laughs) if something is going to be better feel better sell better the whole thing I need to get away I just think six by nine that being like the standard trade size I have never liked that size of book you know and that Mm -hmm. and the reason why it's called trade size is because when you use a trade distributor that is the perfect size for their boxes for their pallets like they actually don't give a shit 
about what a book feels like in your hand. This is like, exactly. yeah. this is the most amount of books we can fit on this pallet, on this forklift into this truck. Mm-hmm. You know, that's all it is. And it's so yeah. annoying. Ugh. I guess that's the beauty of self-publishing is that it's print on demand. And so you don't have to worry about that aspect. You can be really creative. You can make it this way if you wanted to. I mean, if you want to stand out in the marketplace. Um, I was going to ask you about that too. Like you added a bunch of pictures in the book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, so you just did that at the like spur of the moment, like at the like 11th hour, you're like, oh, you know what? I'm going to completely change the formatting of this book and add a ton of pictures. The pictures saved my formatting actually, because I wasn't lining up. Right. And so I was like, I don't want to backspace these poems because I had already made the perfect layout. So I'm like, how am I going to feel this dead space? And so I didn't have any more quotes. So I was like, let me just throw in some pictures from Instagram that kind of correlate with the poem or the pictures that I would have posted with that poem. Oh, my God. I was born. (laughs) Yeah. So it was kind of an error on like a risk, like judgment of do I risk moving, shifting all these poems? to save space or do I work with it and let it flow? So I, that was my choice. Dude. Brilliant. And <laughs> I love that it ended up solving a different problem. Yeah. Like it totally adds so much to the book. And I especially like how like, there's like the scotch tape or mm-hmm. like on the, it, it's just, it's, mm-hmm. it's so cute and it's really good, but here's the whole thing. This is what a lot of people don't get. And I keep yelling this to people when I say like, there's no rock star poets, like you're a rock star poet. Like there is so mm-hmm. much of you in that book. So people read that book and there's a lot of stuff that like pushes them and like makes them feel better and like makes them need to confront stuff about themselves. But you are still like the forefront of that book and seeing your social media posts over the years, seeing pictures of you with your family, like you are that book, you Mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And so many poets are afraid of being like, I I just don't understand it. I've never been able to get it. It doesn't make any sense to me, but you are doing the thing that I always tell people to do. And it's just, it's refreshing. I love it. You're killing it. Um, But yeah, you are a fucking rock star. So own it. That's one thing that I learned from the creative act was the fact that I've been so scared. I used to think I had to have my MFA to be a poet. And so I was like learning the best I could on my own and But now, like even listening to the creative act, I'm like, I don't know if going back to school would hurt my creativity because then I get in a box of rules and Mm -hmm. right now what I want and nobody can tell me that it's wrong. And I kind of like of being an indie artist, like where I taught myself and it's kind of gives me unlimited possibilities with the art. So that's awesome. (laughs) Were you thinking about going back to school recently? I was. Yeah, I was going to. Well, I got my. I got like a certification with creative writing, but they didn't teach poetry. Well, because Texas A&M, they do a really great MFA program in Austin. And so I was like, maybe I'll apply to that. I'm like, why waste the money? YouTube has so many tutorial videos on things. Like yeah. I'm going to go to the University of YouTube and just kind of learn as I go and whatever interests me. And I'm kind of trying to peel away from that idea of just having a document, like certifications and things like that, because I want everybody to be able to create whatever they want, whatever they want without feeling like they have to be educated in a specific way. That's one thing I'd probably like like a chat on is like the writer's guilds and those things like, or the guilds, like what the benefits are being members of those things, because they they always say it's all about who you know. But I think as we progress into this next generation, I think it's all about who knows you with following and stuff like that. Opposed to who you know, so. God damn, somebody just dropped a quote that's going to be quoted by motherfuckers for years. Listen to you drop it. That was you. Oh, a quote? It's not who you know, it's who knows you. Oh. (laughs) Yeah. Every influencer. (laughs) No, but seriously, it's like, I think those things are important if what you want to do is get into the traditional world of writing. And right. you you want to teach. But the other thing you have to know is that there are only so many publications printing writers. Okay. So if you get a room full of writers and like all 500 of them are all sending submissions to the same 20 magazines, it's going to get fucking cutthroat. 
So no mm-hmm. matter how friendly all these fucking people are, it's it's going to get ugly in a bit. So yeah. just just build your own fucking audience, dude. Exactly. Like, and my daughter, she's nine. She just turned nine. And she likes to write. And, and her seeing me self-publish, it's opened up a whole new world of possibilities for her. She She's like, Mom, I'm almost done with my manuscript. You know, Oh, my God. That's so cute. We could, we could get this going. I'm like, all right, I can manage your career. We'll just self-publish. And she's so excited. And she's it's just that that thing I never had as a child, you know, where things are possible. Like, we can do this. You know, mommy's doing it. Just parents. Dude, I just yeah. I went through the exact same thing. Like, I did not get the support. Um, and so when I was raising my kid, I was like, okay, you can do anything you want and I'll help you do it. Just tell me what you want to do mm-hmm. and we'll make it happen because anything's mm-hmm. possible. You just have to have a plan and all this right? stuff. And my kid was all about it until my kid went to high school. And then my kid was like, oh, yeah, you're like kind of nerdy. Don't talk to me. Don't let my friends see you talk to me and all this other stuff. And now like my kid just told me the other day, um, they're an adult now and they live with their partner in an apartment in a city somewhere far away from me. And in just passing, um, my kid's like, oh, yeah, you know, like me and my partner have been like writing a lot of poetry and it's been really cool. Yeah. And, then, and then went right into like, oh yeah, and then I'm also playing Warcraft and all this other stuff. Yeah, and I'm like, exactly. I'm like, oh, you're writing books? Like what? What? Right. You, what like what? <laughs> I was so shocked, and like there has been no conversation about it since. It was like, Dad, I'm acknowledging that you did this, and I am now doing kind of something similar. And we're not talking about it anymore. Yeah. Is kind of how it was, and I was like, wow. Wait till they're in there, like late 20s early 30s, they're going to start calling you and be like you were right you're going to get those phone calls you were so right about this and you were so right about that i will buy you a sports car if my <laughs> kid ever calls me and says you were right <laughs> okay. my kid is the most stubborn gemini on the freaking planet does Let's not make it a vespa <laughs> dude I, a vespa army I'll ride by your house I, oh god i want a vespa so bad now i just like just for parking. Oh my god. Exactly. Parking is brutal. I I I'm I I'm thinking about a smart car. Can you imagine me looking like freaking Donkey Kong and Mario Kart getting into a damn smart car driving around? Oh my god. It's always the tiniest girls that jump out of the biggest trucks in like the burliest men that come out of like the smallest little coops and stuff. <laughs> totally. I saw this like big giant bearded dude, but it was like a very well manicured beard and he had very nice clothes on and a cardigan and everything. <laughs> but he was like walking out of the gym and he's like doing his thing, walking around. And he like walks by me and gives me like a look, like kind of dirty look, like kind of just like don't fucking talk to me kind of thing. And he gets into a fucking fiat. I'm like, this motherfucker. <laughs> rocking a fiat that's so badass but i can't tell him that because he was just mad dogging me so i gotta be all tough with him back to your book your book's out it's been out now for like two months right like by the philosophy of like the book finds the reader when the reader needs to read it and so if my sales aren't up or down i just like to think that it's just not for somebody at that time but it might be at a later time whether it's three or five years from now like it'll be relevant at some point in time and that's what i love about books is They never go out of style. Yeah. The thing that you have to, the thing you have to kind of not contradict that, but like hit that back with is that if people don't know the book exists, those people like are only going to read the book when they need the book. Mm -hmm. But the sooner they get that information, the better. You know what I'm saying? So right. I I agree with what you're saying, but I also agree that we as creators have a, a responsibility to let people know that those things exist for them to That's a good come point. back to, you know? And I just thought about that. Like maybe I like to do book reviews on YouTube. So maybe like, if you like this book, then you're going to like my book kind of. Mm-hmm. Rev- yeah. No top selling poetry books and be like, Hey, if you like that, then you're going to like mine and, you know, drive traffic that way. But yeah, just kind of keeping it creative and not forcing it down their throat. <laughs> okay, well then let's do this right now. If what book out there do you think if people liked that book they would like your book? I like Savannah Brown. I think they might relate if they read Savannah Brown because she's kind of in that Instagram, YouTube realm mm-hmm. of you know poetry, and her stuff is kind of um, metaphorical and 
a little more intrinsic and, and makes you think a little bit. And so, yeah, I think that might pair well there. Like I think graffiti was one of her first books. That she also self-published before getting picked up. Now, do you think that book is stronger than other books that she's put out? Graffiti? Yeah. Yeah, I do actually. <laughs> I think, I think the first books are always like a strong thing because every book after that is like, you're, you're trying to measure up or do better. And sometimes that kind of hurts us as creatives, like, the sophomore kind of, slump. Yeah. Yeah. There's something authentic and raw and real about a first project because you're not really sure about it, but you're willing to take risks and um, there's nothing to compare it to. So it's just like, eh. I so. think too, what a lot of that is, is that when you are creating something for the first time, you're really raw. You show a lot more of yourself. And you're just doing it to do it. But then once you mm -hmm. realize like, oh, wow, I, I made money with this. I could do this. Then you're like, I need to make money. I need to make another book. And so like the, the initial concept is kind of fucked, which is why I'm a huge proponent of people writing a shit ton and just like stockpiling poems. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. like you could put out 17 books and it's all shit you wrote before you fucking sold your first book. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And then, like, those poems are still real. Those poems yeah. are still... <laughs> I didn't so, do that, so that's great. I was listening to a podcast, and he had some advice. I can't remember who it was, but he was saying, like, you just need to be successful. Like, you just need, like, a hundred loyal, genuine people who believe in you. And you can make it. Like, you can make a living. You can do, you know, what you want to do. And I'm like, that's a good thing. Like you don't have to have millions of followers to make millions of dollars. A hundred loyal people who want to support your work when it comes out. And that's enough. And, so. and let me blow your mind with this here a little bit. Um, Cause I've been doing this a little bit longer, you know, and people had different views and different thoughts and all this other stuff. When I first started getting into writing and this was before amazon okay like or before kdp or whatever the thing was mm -hmm. you need ten thousand fans ten thousand people who will like your stuff kdp mm -hmm. comes around and then it was like you need five thousand fans five thousand fans and you can mm -hmm. survive you know then the um kindle gold rush happened and people were like actually you really only need like two thousand fans if you have 2000 mm -hmm. fans, you could do anything. And then like a couple years later, somebody was talking about like, yeah, you know what? Like I have a thousand true fans and that's all you need. And now you're mm -hmm. saying it's already down to a hundred. <laughs> this is fucking Probably. insane. Well, these people are selling like full blown courses. So yeah, I mean, if a hundred people buy a hundred dollar course, then that's a pretty good, you know, chunk of change but you know for books maybe it is a larger number but yeah I, I don't know if it is I don't know if it is because I think a lot of what people especially who came out of the like 2011-2012 ebook boom was they were selling books and getting like a 35% royalty off of 99 cents you know so okay. yeah like I'm, I'm you're gonna need 5,000 people at least if you're yeah, gonna try to make a living off of 35 cents you know KDP what is saying? what sixty, so that's it's incredible. Well, it's it's seventy if your book is over two ninety nine. If your book is okay. under two ninety nine, it's thirty five. Okay. So, and um, depending on your book size and all that other shit for a paperback, that it varies. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's kind of the point I'm making. I I don't know if it's because products are costing more. And people like when I started doing ebooks, like on Amazon and stuff, people selling an ebook for four ninety nine was like crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, are are you trying to go broke? What do you think you're doing? <laughs> and yeah. now, like, you go on Amazon and you'll see ebooks for like seven ninety nine, mm -hmm. eight ninety nine, nine ninety nine. You know, it's like it's kind of fucking crazy. I think it is true. Like, with a hundred true fans, I think you can make it. For real, like whether or not you're selling something for a hundred bucks a pop or something for like 20 bucks a pop, you just have to constantly have those $20 things for people to pick up. All right. Well, is there anything else you want to talk about your book or anything like that? I'm proud of it. I love 
that I did it. Give us the elevator pitch. You have you have 30 seconds. Go. Okay. So my book is called When a Grasshopper Whispers. It's by me, Jessica Fields, also known as the Soft Spoken Poet. It is about a book about healing, mental health, spirituality, coming out of depression, going through all of the ups and downs of life, riding the waves of the ocean of life. And you are guaranteed to read it and feel pain. But I always leave a glimmer of hope in there. It's not a complete downer book. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And that's what this book is about, about speaking up, speaking out about your pain and owning it. So that way you can heal and go on and do better, bigger and better things. Oh, my God. I am so proud of you. That was so good. You said, <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, your metadata is going to be amazing. Like, oh. What's that? What's like, metadata? Um, all the stuff you pick, like, you know how you have to pick like seven keywords and then you have your, um, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, all that other stuff. All those things you said, all those phrases, if they're not already in there on your seven keywords, you could actually add more than seven keywords. You just have to put a comma and then add something else. Oh, yeah. And you can I put did that. I took, your, I took your advice on that. Okay. Like really squeezing all those words in. <laughs> yeah. All those things you said as phrases, like those are potential search terms that people would like go on Google or go on Amazon and search like light at the end of the tunnel. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm at the end of my rope, you know, like things like that. And you just went through like a masterclass of a <laughs> bunch of things that you can say. And that's great. Cause your book is that, you know, you're not like selling them something that you can't deliver on. So mm -hmm. that was great. Good job. Thank you. Thank you for having me and letting me talk to your audience. Cause I'm part of the community here and I just love interacting with everybody and yeah. seeing people on the live chats and stuff. Well, not seeing them, but you know, interacting and yeah, yeah. Here and I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. Tower moments. Far in the distance, a lighthouse once glowed, standing tall in its power on an island all alone. The lighthouse was focused, guiding ships from thundery seas. As a storm brewed beneath the water, the lighthouse unaware. One fateful night, the wind blew like no other. The lighthouse stood firm as the ground began to crack. Like the whip of a paintbrush, the ocean splattered the horizon, destroying the lighthouse, the lighthouse unaware. Amongst the rubble, a light is left shining, guiding ships home on an island all alone. That was my interview with Jessica Fields, poet, author, of i just had it when a grasshopper whispers pick it up on amazon and now we are in butt plug territory so here we are first things first make sure you are prepared for the pre-order crowdfunding campaign for my next collection winner of your mom's sodomy prize for poetry starts march 1st and it's gonna be amazing and i can't wait to tell you more about it Poems About Fucking, out now on my Etsy shop, along with all my other chat books. You can pick those up there. Sign up for my mailing list, and you can get the collection of poems and short stories that's still there for people who sign up, in case this is your first episode here. When I gave the shout-outs to everybody earlier, those are people who support me on Patreon and people who support me on YouTube. And on YouTube, you can either join the Thank You Crew, where you can you get extra stuff and in, including the video versions of this podcast so you can see my face um and all that fun stuff and you can see jessica do her thumbnail routine which is magical it just happens it's crazy and you can also join the anarchy crew where you can get over a hundred videos of lessons and workshops and stuff like that and um, get your stuff out in the um, I don't have any of them here. I guess I put them in the other room. Uh, the Poetic Anarchy Anthology Volumes. Blood Rag Issue 8 out now. If you would like to submit a poem to for the next issue of Blood Rag, send me a poem, 16 lines or less, to ihatematwall.gmail.com. 
and we can talk about it there. Um, just go to IHateMountWall.com for all information on all fun stuff. And for the time being, you can go to PoeticAnarchy.com to take the free workshop, the free five-day workshop to see if joining the Anarchy crew was something that you'd want to do. Keep buying my books. Go buy Jessica's book. Type hard, everybody. And I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.